Good afternoon. So now we're about to start the second part of the second day and final part of the conference. And I would like to ask Dr. Panagiotis Soukakos, Professor of Orthopedics, Medical School, University of Athens, and President of the Board of Trustees of the University of Ioannina, to introduce our next speaker, the President of the Academy of Athens and distinguished physicist, Professor Dimitri Nanopoulos. Professor Soukakos, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor and sincere pleasure to introduce to you Professor Dimitri Nanopoulos, keynote speaker of this fourth Stavros Niarchos Foundation International Confidence Conference and of Philanthropy. Dimitri Nanopoulos is of Greek origin, however, is an international figure and is very renowned theoretical physicist. He is the youngest member ever elected in the Academy of Athens in which this year serves as a president. One very important, very important measure of a scientist, I think, is his choice of problems. Many scientists have keen intellects and mastery of modern science. But finding the answer, finding the answer to a challenging problem takes years, decades, I would say, of efforts to master that problem. As you can imagine, it is essential to choose the right problem. That is to choose those problems that will have the potential to make a major breakthrough in how we understand nature. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Dimitris Nanopoulos has chosen, that was his decision, to tackle great and difficult problems in his career. His answers have as produced mind-changing new insights in modern physics. He has earned international acclaim for his fundamental contribution to the theoretical foundations of modern physics that has spanned more than three decades. In the 1990s, along with his colleagues at CERN, he used the new field of supersymmetry and introduced his famous Gauss theory. Dimitri Danopoulos was one of the founders of the Grand Unified Theory the theory that provides an effective way to combine gravitation, electroweak, and strong forces. This, I would say, was the dream of every physicist, and it's not hyperbole, after the Einstein's era. Professor Nanopoulos also started the string theory and applied to it to cosmology an important step to allow, for, uh, to allow for a deeper understanding of the origin of our universe. 
in recognition of his merit as a great scientist, the Niarchos Foundation has asked Professor Nanopoulos to be their keynote speaker today. So, it's like I said, with great pleasure, honor, and friendship as well, that I welcome and commend to you Dimitris Nanopoulos, a true giant in modern physics. Needless to say, Greece is proud of Dimitri, and I think that we are all expect that his greatest work is yet to come. However, ladies and gentlemen, before I close, let me provide you with a very important and symbolic information as well. Konstantinos Karathodori, a great Greek mathematician, was born September 13, 1873. Dimitri Nanopoulos was born 75 years later, same date, September 13, 1948. Costadinos Karathodori died 1950, and his post, his chair in the Academy of Athens, remained vacant until 1997. Actually, March the 6th, 1997, when Professor Nanopoulos was unanimously elected as member of the Academy of Athens. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor and pleasure to you to introduce to you Professor Dimitri Nanopoulos. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for inviting me here in this uh, conference. Thank you very much, Professor Sukakos. As you understand, he's a very good friend of mine. Uh, now, I'm going to be being a hard scientist, in quotation mark, I mean theoretical physics. Uh, I will have. Uh, I'll read a few things before which more of general interest and then I'll come also on something which then I will not need to read anything. Now, let me start by saying that we live in a very interesting and strange times. The world is not in equilibrium, far from it, and its present state is in flux in every possible way. Now, I'm not here to become the you know, 3,500 person to tell you about what are the problems. Neither we're going to, I have to offer solutions of the problems that we're discussing in this conference. The thing, though, I would like to call your attention, you're much more experts than me on, in, in these things. It is sometimes I will just draw your attention that the problem is not always in the software but also the problem is in the hardware. Now, what I mean by this, it is the following. Usually, what we call culture, it is almost from, if I ask you everybody, I'm not sure that 10% of you is going to use the word science connected to the word culture. And I believe that this is a grave mistake in the following way. I believe that in our times, the real producer of new knowledge is science. And what I mean science is, I live and work in the United States, so I have the Anglo-Saxonic definition, which is math, physics, life science, and the products of, of this kind of thing here. Now, this is a very serious problem, and I believe that this the new knowledge that science is producing has to be diffused to the people. Not only in order to stop 
believing what we're believing, and I'm going to show you a few things where we are today in just a few minutes, right, for this thing. But also somehow it is, we have to have a paradigm shift. Let me use the corresponding historical analogy. The Enlightenment is not a product of just Voltaire and Diderot and Locke in, 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 in Scotland, etc. from this thing. They came after Newton and Galileo and the whole things before the giants, and they opened the way, and these great people that they have created enlightenment somehow was based on this new kind of thing here. I believe we live in a, exactly the same kind of corresponding time. As I said at the beginning, the, walls, the world is in, in flux, and I'm not very optimistic what's going to happen, and I'm not talking about, you know, I'm talking the whole world, you know, sometimes these words may hear that I'm talking about Greece, I'm not talking about Greece. Now, uh, the planet is overpopulated, and I don't know, but a lot of us believe, not coming from this environment, that not very far from here is going to be inhabitable, right, from this thing. Now, people... They have come now to, to conclusions that the great leap is going to happen and eventually we have to go to, to spaceships and get out of here. Now, I know that may sound crazy to you, but somehow that's what some people are thinking about. I'm not talking about the next hundred years or something like that, right from this thing. And somehow what we say here and there's going to be different signs saying the same thing, it is we have to have a wake-up call and use science a little bit more effective than the way that we're using it and somehow make people understand what it is what's going on. Now, let me finish this short introduction here, even if it does not sound very pleasant, but to tell you the following. Somehow, we came from the Dark Ages to the Renaissance, and we moved on. But if you look around in the world, it sounds like we are back in the, in the Dark Ages. Now, what I'm going to say here, and maybe it is not the Dark Ages, there's a lot of light out there, but we continuously keep our eyes wide shut. Now, let me move on now on, on, on this thing here. I use this, I was speaking with uh, Dr. Vasilakis, what we're going to talk about, because I knew what the theme is. And then um, I said, look, I don't belong to this environment. And then anyway, during our discussion, I don't know where is Dr. Vasilakis, somewhere here, he will confirm what I'm saying. During the discussion, then I say this title here, and what I propose now, now we can change to the, I cannot stand over here. Now, uh, so that came to me, and this thing came to me because I said, just a moment now, we're talking about our planet is four, million, four billion, six hundred million years and stuff like that. We're talking about a universe here with 13.8 billion years, right, for this thing. And it's found a way to be there. So, and if people in 2015 were producing what we're going to see now, somehow we should have the brains to, to resolve our problems here, right, from this kind of thing. I like this message to, to come home. Now, um, here it is. This is if you have someone who is outside our universe, the three dimensions and four dimensions of space, don't worry, I'm going to be very, very uh, short and I'm not going to use any uh, jargon here. Now, if we go out for our four dimensions, three space and time, and you have someone who was looking at this thing, what you see here, it is the whole universe from the beginning here until now, right, for this thing. Here is evolving space, and of course, as time, the, we're living in a universe that is expanding. It started basically from zero, I'm coming to this to a moment, and it's expanding all the way, and today here we are with our uh, telescopes, space telescopes, etc., etc., we're getting all this information. We're very lucky that we hear that the universe is expanding because you see what's happening is we're getting, we can collect light or electromagnetic radiation 
right from this thing, from the very, almost from the very beginning, right from this thing here, which analyzes light with this, these telescopes here. And what we do then, it is we have now the way that the universe was, let's say, in the beginning. So what I'm talking here, it is not just philosophical or metaphysical or whatever you want to call it discussions. We have the data in our hands from the very beginning. Right for this thing. I mean, this is new because this thing has happened in the last 20 years or something like that, all this information. Now, as you see here, we have now, we started here as the universe was evolving. It contains a lot of structure, as you know. You know that we have a universe of 100 billion galaxies, and each galaxy contains 100 billion stars, let's say, like our, our, our sun. Now, imagine now from all of this, what we are now, we are, you know, some random existence in a random planet of a random star, of a random galaxy. It's nothing special if you look, because we know how the lagas are looking, right, from this kind of here. And here we are now, four billion, six hundred million years after, discussing about all of these things, right, for this. Just to tell you our measure in, the, in this kind of thing. Nevertheless, with our brain, we have clarified a lot of issues, even finding the ones that I'm just telling you. Now, let's see now what is going on. The first, just to remind you that we are not only not the center of the universe, and I explained before why. The second is we are not even made from the stuff that the most of the universe is made of. What we are made of, it is only the 4% of the whole kind of, as you see here, the whole pie here, right, for this thing. We are here only about 4%, then we have this, whatever it's called, dark matter, never mind now, 23%, and what we call dark energy, 73%. So we're not even made from the stuff that most of the universe is made of, right, from this. Keep that in mind. Now, what it is going on here, now you see what is happening here. We start here from the very beginning, and we were evolving, and then you see in different ways that it is, for instance, here this all matter was created, the one that you know, and we have the standard way of doing things, and eventually we come up here, and now we can reproduce some of this stuff, not only from the telescopes that you just saw in the, in the first transparency, but also from reproducing this from the colliders like at CERN, the Large Hadron Collider. Because of these big energies corresponding to big temperatures, and that means now that somehow there, in a miniature, we produce kind of the conditions that was in the universe around, actually not down here, but around this, this region here, which is pretty, we're talking about, let's say, 10 to 1 millionth of 1 billionth of, of a second or something like that, which is pretty good to start with, right, for this thing here. Now, here is something which is very interesting. It is the following thing. Now, what you see here, it is what we, most of us believe, and believe is not believe dogmatic, but is through our equations or through some of the data. What is happening here, it is the three-dimensional space that we're living, that we live here, it is, is a fake. I mean, this is real, but it's more. What is more is at each point, as you, I try to show here, it is, this is supposed to be very close, of course, just to see it, then contains now another six dimensions that they're very, very, very folded, as you see, in different ways, right, for this thing. Now you say, why you have to care about this extra dimension, which is very, very small, and we're never going to see them? Well, we have to care because now these extra dimensions, and for instance, you can see, now why it does not move? Does not, something is, I didn't mean to have that, time, that long. Ah, oh, here we are, okay. Now, for instance, things like that, right? Now, why we care about this, or we have to care about this, because the physical laws, gravity, electromagnetism, whatever you, you learn in high school or in the university or whatever it is, are depending on what, how these dimensions are folded. What I'm telling you, it is as the universe appears from basically the quantum fluctuation from nothing, and in the very beginning is in 10 dimensions, let's say, the six 
are folded. The way that these six are folded, then exactly what is telling us what will be the physical laws that are coming with this universe. So it's the first time since we came down from the trees or whatever you want to count, right, from this kind of thing here, that we have now an answer to the, to the, to the real problem of how the physical laws were created. Right? This is not a small fist here, right, from this uh, kind of thing here. Now, and now, that says what I was saying before, right, from this uh, kind of thing here. Now, let me show you something before I close. Can we go to the next one? Ah, here. In order to show to you, and we'll go on to the end of this, so your torture is over. Now, all of this, then you say, well, how talk about this and where's experimental data and stuff like that. Okay, let me show you where's experimental data. What you see here, it's the following thing. This is our universe, and what you see over here, it is the temperature because the universe is cooling down from the very beginning. We have a cosmic background radiation, as we call it, which is about 2.73 degrees Kelvin, but it is not exactly homogeneous and isotropic everywhere. If it was homogeneous and isotropic everywhere to 100%, then we would not be here in this room now. Right for this thing. Because in order to be in this room, we must have some perturbations, energy density perturbations. So somewhere something is going to be a little bit more, somewhere will be less. When it is more, because gravity is attractive force, then it's going to have more stuff there, and that's how the scale, the large scales that we see around has been created from the very, 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 very beginning. Right? From this thing. So now here, as you see, what is you, you see here, you see blue and you see red, etc. It means we have up and down and different, very, very small perturbations. But that was enough, and look what's happening here. I take, take you project one part here, and then you can use through simulations with the supercomputers that exist only in the United States, two or three of them, right, from this kind of thing here. And they start now from this small perturbation that we see here through a chain of through an algorithm, and they somehow they start producing galaxies. So I'm telling I'm showing you this in order to see that this is not, and then you compare with the real galaxies, and then you see the same thing, I mean, from, from this thing here. So somehow there is a lot of thinking here that that's one way that we can see this. And now that's my final thing here. And then you see now what is going on. I told you that you are going to see other temperatures up, down, and stuff like that. And in order to see that we know what we're talking about, you see this curve, this green curve that you see here, it was there from 81, 82 from the theories, from different groups. And we were saying, if you do, and then you do all of this law of thinking, then that I was describing at the beginning, then if you go and look at the data, the ones that I showed you before, then you are going to find out what is going on, right, from this thing. That's, that's you should find that up and down, et cetera, et cetera. And now, of course, here we're talking about very, very, very small differences, right, for this thing, but still observable. And here now it is 2013 and 2014. This is from what is called the Planck satellite, the European Space Agency satellite. And look now at the data, what is going on, and tell me now if this thing it is accidental or what, right, from this kind of thing. I mean, this is the stuff. Because in order to get to this result, I have gone through all the analysis we did before, right, for this thing. If that was wrong, then we will go back at every step and say now, how could it be wrong, right, from this thing? I'm not claiming that by just doing this, we prove everything. No, of course, we have other tests and checks and, 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 and things to get, right, from this kind of thing. But we are in a very good way and we're very amazed. I never believed in my life, in my own lifetime, that we're going to have the technology to get to, I mean, I knew personally inside, but that's not a scientific statement, that we were right. But I will see something like that in my own lifetime, right, from this kind of thing. So. I'll stop here. I, I spoke enough right from this thing. What I'm trying to tell you here, it is the world is changing. We are not living now in the 
18th century and the 19th century. It's amazing things are happening right from this kind of thing. And I close with the same statement. If people, if there are human brains, that they have brought us this, right from, from this kind of thing here, don't tell me that we cannot resolve problems, you know, what's happening, how to make our, our planet non-inhabitable. Thank you very much. Come on, you must have some questions. Yes, somewhere? Yeah. Hello, Mr. Nanopoulos. I'm very happy to see you today. And I really appreciate your work, but I want to be honest. First of all, I don't know anything about uh, physics. I work on the communication issues. And I want to be honest and admit that I did not understand what this curve was about. Ah. And I'm very, this is very important for me to understand what exactly we are talking about in okay. this curve. OK, perfect. So you asked for it, you get the explanation now, right? For this thing. OK, so can we go back? Here. OK. So let me explain what this curve is. Now, what we do here, here you see this angle, right? From, start from, let's say, one tenth of a, or one hundredth of a degree, goes up to 90 degrees, right? From this thing. Now, what they, do, what they do is, let's say, if they go and they look in this one specific point in the sky, right? For this thing. And then they go there, and then they take an, and they measure the temperature. They know how to do this kind of thing within a small limit there. Then they go somewhere else and they measure the same thing here. Now, in general, as I would say, this is not exactly the same. If in homogeneous, where is the gentleman here I'm, with the light? That, now, when, if it was the, the, world, the universe was homogeneous and isotropic, then should find the same temperature. That means now, if you do here, you should flat, flat line there, right, from this thing. Now, so they don't see this, right, for this thing. But they see ups and downs and stuff like that. Now, what it is, it is if I go there and I go there, and you see now they measure the whole sky from 100th of a degree up to 90 degrees, right from this kind of thing here. And they find now what is that, and then they plot the temperature difference that they see with respect to the, to the central value, right from this thing here, as a function of, of, of angle, right from this thing. They measure some power and they do this kind of thing here. So they find these ups and downs and stuff like that, as would expect. Now, this, the green line, was calculated theoretically, right, for this thing. You know, assuming what I was showing before, you can do a real calculation and say, if they go and do this thing, measure what, as I des described here, then they should find this, right? So the green line was there from 30-something years now. The red points, it is, in 2013 and 2014, the Planck telescope gave us the results and look now what is happening, how that's agreement. That's considered to be very good agreement. I mean, theory should be very happy about this. So that was the thing. And I repeat again, I'm not claiming that by doing this, you have finished it. No, we have a lot of cross checks that we need to do and stuff like that, and they are doing it. But this is one of the major, if that thing was, fell down, then the whole thing would be problematic, right, for this thing. Thank you for asking the question. I think that means it's time to go. Thank you very much.